Welcome everybody to the uh, the latest in the NERI series of uh, monthly webinars. Today we're, we're going to be discussing the future of the Irish social welfare system, participation and protection. Uh, uh, this, uh, this presentation is based on a NESC paper, number 151 I believe, uh, written by Dr. Helen Johnston and Dr. Anne-Marie McGarren. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Johnston here today. Um, Helen's doctorate is in governance. Uh, she joined NESC as senior policy analyst in 2007 and has worked on issues such as uh, well-being and so social reporting. She's done work for the OECD on social disadvantage. She's former director of the Combat Poverty Agency. She's a native of Northern Ireland and has worked in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Um, she is the chair of the uh, she is chair of the Center for Cross Border Studies and is on the National Statistics Board. Um, so Helen is going to speak for uh, somewhere between thirty to thirty five minutes, and then uh, uh, Michael Taft from SIP2 will respond for about ten minutes. And just to say, we also have Dr. McGarren on the call here, so uh, she may be best placed to answer some of the questions that we have at the end. Just to say as well that this um, seminar uh, will be uh, recorded or is being recorded and will be put up on the Nevin Economic Research Institute website, uh, hopefully uh, sometime tomorrow or this evening. And uh, with that, uh, I will cede the floor to, uh, to Helen uh, and uh, I look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the very long introduction, Tom. I actually was on the National Statistics Board, but I am no longer on that uh, board in case you're kind of wondering who I am. Um, so uh, it's a bit strange to be talking into my uh, laptop, but I, I guess that's how most people are spending their days talking to their laptops. Um, rather than seeing people in person. So I hope everybody can hear me and can see the screen okay. So just on then to uh, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, it, it is based on a report that we published in November. So I'll just talk about how the work came about, uh, some of the features uh, of the welfare system and the challenges and opportunities that it's facing. And then we have what we call four trajectories for reform. These are ensuring income adequacy and alleviating poverty. Then something on modernizing family supports to reflect gender and care needs. Um, uh, some uh, proposals on supporting high participation, including a pilot on participation income, and then enhancing the financial sustainability of uh, the system. Um, I'll say some words just about the importance then of implementation and uh, end up with uh, looking at some of the implications of COVID-19. Most of our work was done before COVID hit, um, but before we published the report, we thought it would be useful uh, to take uh, that experience into account. So on then to the origin of the work, um, it started out when we got a request from the Department of Social Protection in 2018 uh, to look at uh, social insurance, particularly uh, in relation to the contributory uh, principle and to its sustainability. Um, and then we received a further request to look at broader issues in the systems in relation to um, integration uh, and its overall sustainability. So as part of the work, we prepared nine papers, um, eight of which were considered by our council. And uh, these will be published on our website. Um, they're being updated at the moment. I, there's two, uh, two there at the moment, and there's a third one will be up in the next week or so. Um, and we'll continue to put those up over the next couple of months. So when the nine papers were prepared, we then set up a working group, which was chaired by Tony McCashin. And we worked through the proposals in the, the nine papers, and uh, 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 that resulted in the uh, proposals that we have in the report that I'm going to talk about today, um, which was published in November 2020. And um, it was co-authored by myself and Anne-Marie uh, McGurran, as Tom has already said, and Anne-Marie will answer the difficult questions uh, today. I'm happy to take the others. Okay, so then just a very quick summary on some of the features of the Irish social welfare system that we set out in the report. And the first one really is 
uh, in relation to uh, economic inequality. And just to say that uh, we don't think the social welfare system is in crisis, but it does confront a number of challenges. Uh, one of these is that market inequalities are quite high in Ireland, so it means that the social welfare system has to work harder, and it does quite a good job, but it just means that the high level of market income inequality is having to be addressed by that system, and we need to look at how that inequality uh, can be reduced um, through labour market uh, policies um, and other approaches. The second feature is um, the mix of cash and services in the Irish social welfare system. And here we have a very high level of cash compared to services. And the 2005 report on the developmental welfare state that the, um, uh, the NESC published said that one of the most uh, biggest improvements that could be made to the overall system was uh, the improvement of services. Now, this report that we've uh, published in November that I'm talking about today is focused more on the income support side, but there is a recognition of the need to improve services to complement income support. And of course, it, it is easier uh, in many ways to increase payments, um, and it, that's really the responsibility of just one department, the Department of Social Protection, whereas the improvement of services is more complex uh, with a number of different departments involved. We're talking about childcare, disability, housing, education, these kind of areas. Um, and so they're more complex and more difficult to improve, but that's not to say um, that that shouldn't be done. So that's just a feature of the system that we have a high reliance on cash uh, uh, income supports as opposed to services. The third area is the role of social insurance, which is where this work started. And in, in European terms, Ireland has a fairly weak system of social insurance. Um, and it's weak in relation to its uh, contributory principle um, and the balance. It, even though it is one of the principles, we need to kind of look at the principle between uh, the contributory contribution element and the redistribution and solidarity elements of the social insurance system. And I'll talk more about that later. So just then in, in summary, uh, the social welfare system in Ireland can be seen as a hybrid of universal insurance-based and means-tested payments. Um, it's funded by the social insurance fund, but also a substantial contribution from the exchequer. And that varies uh, depending on the economic conditions at the time. So uh, just moving on then to look at some of the uh, challenges and opportunities. And these are um, demographic, social and economic uh, challenges. And that's not surprising in a way. Many countries are uh, facing these challenges. Um, and, and just to say the system was originally set up in the middle of the 20th century when circumstances were very different uh, to those that prevail today. Um, and so I'm not going to spend too long on these, but just to kind of flag them up so that you have a context for the trajectories for reform that I'll talk about next. So some of the issues that are very widely discussed are population aging and our, our uh, population is aging as is others, but not as quickly. So we have some time um, to address these issues. So the report doesn't deal specifically with pension issues. There is a, a commission on pensions who are looking at those, but we do allude to things like the uh, pension age and pensions policy and the total uh, contributory approach um, that, that's being introduced. So it is a challenge for the overall uh, system. The second area is the changing patterns of work, and we do look at that in some detail. Um, gone are the days of the job for life, uh, the nine to five, um, with much more part-time working, atypical working, uh, featuring now issues of low pay and so on. So though the social welfare system is now having to take that uh, into account. I've already mentioned uh, the inequality of income, uh, which is a challenge and on the wealth side as well. And Anne-Marie, my colleague has done some work on this and it, the wealth is actually more unequal um, than the income. And that's something that needs to be taken into account as well and a, a challenge going forward. And related to that then, related to that is the need to reduce consistent poverty. And that's one of the main reasons why we have a social welfare system is um, to keep people out of poverty. 
Um, and so there's consistently a number of groups, lone parents, people with disabilities, people who are unemployed, who are in consistent poverty. And the, the welfare system needs to find supports for that, either through income or services, with child poverty being a kind of continual issue that needs to be addressed. So there's some focus on how children are dealt with in, in the social welfare system. And then as well, uh, we talk about the funding challenge um, and how sustainable the social insurance fund is going forward. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Okay, so a, a broader area is the changing family structures. And obviously uh, the system was set up under uh, the male breadwinner model where a, a married couple with children, the man tended to work, the woman tended to bring up the children. And of course that has all changed now. And the system has changed to reflect that. Uh, but we think that that probably needs to go further as well uh, with men and women both uh, at work and how then to support children within that system. Um, there are also changes in housing and pension provision and these relate really to the privatisation of risk. Um, and so if you're not in a position, if you're aligned on public services as opposed to private provision, um, there is a widening gap there and what are the implications of that for the social welfare system. And then there's international uh, challenges that uh, countries are facing uh, in relation to uh, globalization. Um, and obviously that relates to uh, finance and trade, but also to immigration and how that's impacting um, on the country in general and then reflected in the social welfare system. And related to that is a changing balance of world power towards the east and the factors of climate change and the policies that are being brought in to address that. And of course, we had the, the, the climate bill um, being published yesterday. Um, and so the implications of that for the social welfare system. And finally, just then the challenges and opportunities we look at is the support that's there for welfare, welfare provision. And this can vary and sometimes is, is support for it or less support. And I think the COVID challenge has brought that to light and a number of people have seen the value of having a good uh, uh, social welfare system. Right, that brings me on then to the trajectories uh, for reform. Um, and they're situated within this framework um, that we present uh, what we call a continuum um, for the future. So if you look at where Ireland's position is on that and how we have uh, phrased the framework is that on the left hand side, we have means testing mainly uh, through social insurance and social uh, systems mixed to social insurance mainly and then universal payments. And we situate Ireland here in the middle really of the social insurance and social assistance uh, mix. And I, I, the proposals that we put forward would be to move move Ireland towards the right to the social insurance mainly, but recognising that there'll still be a place for means tested payments for those who can't avail of social insurance and they need to look at tapering um, on how we can taper uh, benefits. So, okay, the uh, four areas of proposals. The first one is on ensuring income ad adequacy and alleviating poverty. And we make three proposals here. The first one is in relation to ensuring that welfare payments are adequate uh, to prevent poverty. Um, that's, that should be pretty obvious. Um, but what we think is required here is an agreed mechanism to do that, possibly setting up a group of people with expertise to calculate these things, something like the Low Pay Commission. Um, and there's been important work done here around what average wage levels are and how the social welfare rates should relate to that, but also the work done by the Vincentian partnership, looking at the actual cost of living and how much different family types and people living in different parts of the country, how much uh, for them to have a minimum um, adequate essential uh, standard of living. A second area the proposal here then is about improving child income support. At the moment, we have a three tier system. We have the universal child benefit. Um, then we have the qualified child additions for people who are on uh, social welfare benefits. And then we have the working family payment for people with children um, who are, are in low paid jobs. And I suppose what we're, we're uh, suggesting here is that the, the uh, qualified child additions and the working family payment requirements are combined. 
at the moment there's a gap if somebody takes up a job they will uh, lose their qualified child additions and they will have to apply to see if they're eligible for the working family payment and that requires documentation from their employer and so on and so there can be a time delay and this can put people off this uncertainty of transitioning from welfare to work particularly where there's children involved so we we believe and we NESC have done work on this before that it should be possible to combine these two payments now with the IT systems that we have so that there's a smooth transition which we think would encourage uh, more people to take up work and uh, reduce some of the uncertainty. And the third proposal in this area is about um, providing the supportive services. And I've talked about this earlier about the mix between cash and services and the importance of services, particularly in the areas of uh, education, childcare, healthcare, and housing. And we make some proposals in, in relation to that. Okay, to move on then to the next area, and that's modernizing family supports to reflect gender and care needs. And again, there's been many improvements made here, but we think the system needs to go further to reflect modern society. Um, and one of the things that has been introduced is uh, the uh, uh, job uh, transition scheme for, for lone parents. Um, and we think that that could be then uh, extended to qualified adults. Qualified adults are um, the partners of people who are in receipt of a means tested payment. Um, and at the moment, uh, there's no uh, conditionality attached to that. Whereas for a lone parent, when their uh, youngest child reaches the age of seven, they have to engage in education and training, job search and so on. But basically it's to engage with the system. Um, and we see no reason why qualified adults um, that that shouldn't be considered um, for them. So, um, and then in relation just to, there's a number of um, areas in internationally um, where uh, there's individualization uh, applied to couples in receipt of uh, welfare benefits. And we think it's useful uh, to look at some of the approaches that have been uh, taken um, in other countries so that qualified adults can receive uh, payments in their own right. But then again, uh, there may need to be an element of activation um, in relation to that. Okay, there's also a need then to support a better balance of work and family commitments and to some extent that 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 is happening. Um, but there's a role here for employers too to acknowledge more flexible work patterns and for the system to acknowledge uh, the need for leave at certain times when children are small and so on. I think we've seen that particularly in relation to COVID. Um, where suddenly people are having to work from home, they have to manage childcare, they're having to manage homeschooling, which is an unusual event. But there's a need for some flexibility. And I think the uh, outcome of some of that is that productivity uh, from an employer's perspective hasn't necessarily fallen and sometimes it has increased. So I think the kind of forced experiment of uh, having more flexible work patterns um, has brought some benefits, obviously there's drawbacks as well. So, but some of the benefits um, could be carried through into the social welfare system. And finally, on this uh, second trajectory of reform, there is the element of taxation. At the moment, uh, there's transferability of credits between married couples, but there's no recognition of children per se. And what we're suggesting, and I'll go back to the point I made about the importance of trying to address child poverty, um, is about having transferability of credits uh, for people with children, for couples with children, whether they're married or, or cohabiting. And that's maybe something that could be considered. We recognise there may be a constitutional change required for some of these, but in terms of modernising the system is something that could be uh, thought about. Moving on now to the third trajectory, and that's about supporting high participation, high participation in the labour market, but also high participation in society. And again, we have four proposals on this one. Uh, the first one is about dealing with the complexities of the changing world of work. And a lot of, um, a lot of changes have been made or recognition of that in relation to atypical working patterns in terms of platform working, um, trying to um, uh, address uh, uh, people who are taken on in a self-employed basis, but are in fact um, seen as employees. And there's been some um, 
movement in that direction. And what we're suggesting here is that a tripartite group or a similar body, um, a tripartite group such as a leaf or a similar body would be set up to consider the changes that are happening and uh, what other changes need to be made in codes of practice or indeed in legislation. The second area then is the need for a more inclusive public employment service and much has, has been written about this and there was a big transformation of the public employment service after the last uh, economic crash. Um, but we feel that there's still, with groups more distant from the labour market, there's a need for more supportive engagement, there's a need for recognition, recognition of the various barriers that people uh, might be facing and how those uh, barriers can be addressed. So it's not a, a one size fits all, but it's more tailored supports. Uh, it's a more a range of diverse responses that may be required, building up trust, identifying the skills that the people have, uh, and then what, what's the, the, the best way uh, to support them uh, to move on uh, in their lives. Probably one of the more innovative uh, proposals that we are uh, proposing is um, a piloting a participation income scheme. And what we're seeing here is that uh, from previous work we've done as well, there's a lot of people who are not uh, formally employed, but who carry out important uh, societal uh, contributions, either through caring, um, uh, through volunteering, through environmental uh, initiatives in their localities and so on. And there could be more recognition for the value of that work uh, to society and also to support people uh, to recognize that work and to support them to uh, develop or continue on in, in, in jobs or in their career or in their education and training. Um, and the idea here would be to pilot a participation income scheme where people would receive an income for such work, which could be part time or full time, um, which would be a, a voluntary participation scheme um, as well. Now, some schemes do that type of work, um, the community employment scheme, TUS, um, so the, um, the rural social scheme, but those schemes have a lot of eligibility conditions attached to them and requirements and aren't suitable for everyone. So I suppose we're saying that either some of those schemes should be revised and or um, a, an additional scheme should be piloted with a kind of a more open criteria, which would support this kind of work. And I think we've seen the value of that um, in the COVID-19 responses. Um, the uh, community call, for example, um, was an example of, of, of galvanizing um, local support. And the final point here is in relation to support for low paid workers without children. For low paid workers with children, they get the, the working family payment, but for, for others who uh, don't have children, there's no such support. And many, many, many of them may find themselves in low paid jobs. Um, and if they're trying to live independently, um, that can be quite difficult. So. Uh, there's a suggestion that the uh, working family payment could be amended to account for that or um, a, a refundable tax credit uh, could be introduced and that's where people aren't earning enough to avail of their tax credit and so they could be refunded that amount at the end of the year. So then the fourth area um, that we looked at was about enhancing the financial sustainability of the system and here we consider three options. Uh, one was increased funding, and second is to manage expenditure, or else then to look at other what we call external actions outside of the social welfare system. In terms of increasing funding, uh, one obvious one is to increase the PRSI rates, and we find uh, suggested that particularly for the self-employed who are currently paying a much lower rate, but are now able to avail of most of the benefits um, which uh, uh, PRSI payers uh, can, can avail of, but they're getting that at, at, at value for money. And I think there's some support for that amongst the self-employed themselves. So um, a second area here is to assess tax on all forms of income. And here we're looking at new kind of forms of income, such as digitization, telemigration, um, and, uh, in, and uh, other forms of capital taxes and so on. And also the need to cap tax expenditures um, particularly in um, uh, 
the range of there's a wide range of these expenditures. So it could be that those should be reviewed um, uh, on a regular basis, um, and those that are no, no longer uh, necessary um, could could be uh, reduced. Um, and finally, here is to look at multiple rates of tax. At the moment, we just have the two rates of uh, of tax, and it is possible that we could have. Uh, further rates of tax to make the system more progressive. It already is quite progressive, but we could make it more progressive. And something like the USC bans and so on could, could provide a kind of a model for that. And secondly, then, as well as increasing funding, we could uh, look at managing expenditure, which of course we do already, but um, there are particular areas that we could look at further. And some of these are already being examined, things like uh, the pension age, would people work longer? I know that's been quite controversial, but it is um, something that can be considered. The need to benchmark where benefits are. Um, and also in some countries, there are areas where benefits um, have been lowered, for example, maybe pensions for the better off. But these are all quite controversial, we know, but that's not to say that they couldn't be considered costed and looked at who the winners and losers are. And then the other uh, third area here is to look outside of the system. So in terms of making the system more uh, financially sustainable, if we had more people in the labor force, we would then have more contributors to the social insurance system. So that could mean people working longer. It could mean encouraging immigration um, of working age people into the country um, and also or increasing uh, initiatives to increase fertility. And also then the uh, Commission on Pensions is obviously looking at this, but we could look at easing the cost of pension provision. Okay, so we're near, nearly the end, we just look quickly at uh, implementation. Um, so the thing is as well, it's all very well to have proposals and recommendations and policies, but uh, attention needs to be given to how, how they're implemented, um, who drives that forward, what leadership is shown, uh, the technicalities of how that can be done. So that's an important element in terms of uh, moving forward. Also, um, to garner public support, and that's very important so that people understand the benefits of uh, changes that are being made and the benefits of the uh, social welfare system and its associated services. Also, um, the there are some administrative reforms that we think would make um, the social welfare system kind of easier to na navigate. Um, we're not we did look at you know how you could combine different benefits and so on, like the uh, UK universal credit system and so on. But there's a lot of drawbacks to that as well because these are set up to meet particular contingencies, and sometimes when when you combine them, you you lose the nuances um, and the tailored uh, elements. But we think it would be useful to have a working group to set up to look at where there are inconsistencies between the various benefits in terms of their income disregards and their cutoffs and thresholds and so on, and also the possibility of having a single portable means test, um, because quite often people have to give their uh, uh, information to the system over and over again, and it would be useful. But a caution there as well, because if people are excluded from one benefit, um, and there's a passport system, it can mean they're excluded from others. So there just needs to be some care taken there. And also we could look at restructuring uh, bans and rates of the PR PRSI and the USC where they combine particularly in and around the minimum wage. Um, there's some blips in the system there. So that's something that we, we could look at. And of course, um, the need for good data and research. And, uh, we make some proposals around that in relation particularly for qualified adults. If we know more about qualified adults, we could do more on the individualization and uh, gender aspects um, and also the importance of research and evaluations. And the system has been quite good at doing the value for money reviews and ev other evaluations of the various initiatives. Um, but obviously that needs to continue. So I just want to finish up then with uh, looking at the implications of uh, COVID-19. Um, and just to say that whenever uh, COVID hit us and <laughs> suddenly we were in lockdown this time last year, um, I, I think most people would agree there was a swift and what we call a purpose, purposeful response um, with the pandemic unemployment payment, uh, the tax uh, wage subsidy scheme, which then became the employment wage subsidy scheme and the enhanced illness benefit scheme. And it really showed, I think, the social welfare system in a very positive light that it was able to act so quickly and uh, get, get uh, um, payments out to people 
Um, and the wage subsidy scheme is an interesting one as well because it maintained the link uh, with employers, uh, which we feel is very important to have that link. So we made then a number of proposals uh, on the back of that. Uh, it won't dwell too much on them because I'm sure you want to get to the question and answer. Um, but uh, we did uh, suggest uh, it makes a case for a stronger social insurance system. And I've talked about that um, in the main body of the talk today. And uh, to reconsider flex security, which is the system, I suppose it emanated from Denmark, but um, NESC have talked about it before, which is where people transition between jobs. And, um, but uh, there's a fairly high level of social welfare uh, to support that. Um, and, and I think the COVID experience brought that to light through the wage subsidy scheme in particular and the importance of that, uh, those links with employers and the importance of a substantive payment such as the PUP was when it was introduced. Um, a better recognition of atypical work and that was done through um, the uh, wage subsidy schemes and so on. And so recognition that that's, that's the way people are working now. Obviously we need to uh, ensure that, that those are good jobs, um, but it's not that everybody will work a nine to five. Uh, greater tapering in the withdrawal of benefits. Um, again, we were seeing this now happening in the HAP, uh, the housing assistance payment, um, and in the national child care, child care scheme. And it was introduced then as part of POP. So there's a, a need to really, rather than having the cliff edge, they need to try and uh, have the information to be able to see how payments can be uh, more gradually withdrawn. Uh, stronger anti-poverty measures, of course, that's the real reason or one of the main reasons for the social welfare system. Um, we still have the uh, numbers uh, at risk of poverty, particularly subgroups, um, and we need to put into place stronger uh, measures to address that. And that will certainly, in terms of unemployment and so on, be something that will need a strong consideration um, post-COVID. More appreciation of caring. And again, we saw the kind of reaction to childcare supports and so on as a uh, response to, to COVID. Um, I think there is a greater net recognition of the role of uh, uh, people who are looking after children and also for older people and people with disabilities um, and the importance of the social welfare system wrapping itself around some of those uh, supports um, to accommodate people um, to undertake those roles. I've talked about the pilot participation income. And again, I think COVID made a stronger case for that. Um, and then just to kind of finish on a NESC note, really, um, I know the NESC Developmental Welfare State has talked about the importance of income supports, and services and community uh, innovation. And while this report that I've been talking about today mainly focuses on the income support side, um, the system was much better uh, when there are supportive services and community uh, innovation. So it's really the importance of uh, supporting that as well. And particularly on the community innovation side, uh, we saw the importance of that in responding to COVID. So I just want to say thank you for your attention. I'm quite happy to answer questions, as is my colleague, um, Anne-Marie McGowan. Um, and just to say that we are uh, having a, an event about the report on the 30th of April. It's actually an online conference. Um, we'll have international speakers, a panel of speakers, and uh, relevant workshops. So I hope that some of you will be able to attend that event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen, for uh, an excellent, thorough and impressive piece of work. Um, our respondent today is Michael Taft. Uh, Michael is well known from his Notes on the Front blog. He is a researcher at SIP2, uh, the country's largest trade union. Before that, he was a researcher at United Trade Union, and he is now a member of the Low Pay Commission. So Michael is going to speak for, is going to give a response for about 10 minutes and following on from that, we'll move directly to the question and answer session. So Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Neri for the invitation to respond to this debate and to uh, Helen John Dr. Helen Johnson on her, uh, uh, on her presentation of a report which is with both in-depth, provocative, and most importantly, accessible and I believe should form the foundation of the debate over the future of the social protection system. Okay, the first question is, what is the purpose uh, uh, of social protection? Is it one, uh, to be uh, about poverty prevention, 
and ensuring adequate incomes, which can all too often be usually defined as a minimal, the most minimal expenditure level uh, possible on the, on, the, uh, on the side of adequacy. Or two, is it an instrument of social solidarity where everyone pays in according to their abilities and then uh, uh, are able to access payments according to their need? I mean, the choice has real policy implications. Poverty prevention is most likely to produce targeted expenditure uh, or means tests, whereas a solidarity model is likely to produce an insurance-based programs or even an egalitarian model of universal uh, access. So it's very welcome that uh, NEST wants to, wants to see the system move towards a more insurance-based system. Uh, in fact, they, it's a, 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 a really helpful um, uh, description uh, of it that they use, a collective altruistic principle of democratic society. But such a reorientation of the system is, me, is more than just about transforming the model itself. I mean, to take a couple of examples. First, market inequality. NESC is right to point out the social protection system has to work hard to overcome the high levels of market inequality. When you consider that 20% of workers are officially described as low paid and we have the highest level of wage inequality among our peer group in the EU. And further, when Neri has found that over half a million people suffer from some type of precarious work contract, a figure that rises when you actually factor in precarious living standards. Now, this imposes costs on the system. It imposes complexities. The rational response is to limit market inequalities before they interface with social protection. Usually, when you talk that, when you go down that road, people immediately think, well, a higher minimum wage and more state regulation of labor markets, especially in the area of uh, the gig economy and other precarious work contracts. These can be helpful, but in some cases, there are even more effective interventions that come from civil society itself. And in particular, the right of workers to bargain collectively in their company or at sectoral level. Collective bargaining raises wage floors while at the same time reduces precariousness. If pay and living standards are raised, then the social protection system has less damage to repair. I think the NEST report put it uh, very well when they said, recourse to the income support system uh, to support low paid workers should be the exception rather than the rule. The second example is this higher participation, which Helen referred to. Uh, now, higher participation is given there are high level of uh, low intensity, low work intensity households uh, would again uh, relieve that a, a lot of that uh, work the social protection system has to do to bring about greater equal outcomes. But there's no sense in strongly encouraging or incentivizing or barracking people back into the workforce when uh, the uh, community supports are so limited. And in this, in this I'm thinking particularly of the childcare system. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the childcare system, we all know its faults. But the lack of a proper childcare system and, those and family supports in the community makes it very difficult to uh, raise participation. Or it's, part, it's hard to raise participations when people, the only people, the only work that people can access is low pay or precarious work, where income is uncertain, where hours are uncertain, which makes it impossible uh, to uh, juggle uh, work and carrying responsibilities. So in the first, we need to invest in community and social supports uh, to, to facilitate people's entry into the formal economy, even on a part-time basis. And again, alongside state regulation, we need collective bargaining, uh, which has been shown to reduce precariousness. And in this respect, it's about giving people in the workplace the democratic tools that they, democratic tools, so that they can start helping contribute to the solution of the problem. Another aspect of, uh, of the social protection system with, which NEST focuses on is um, transforming social protection uh, in a way that we can that changes the way we consume social consume it consume social protection. 
for instance, um, cash benefits tend to have been developed much more rapidly than services. And Ness has called for the radical development of services as the most important route to improving social protection. In short, we uh, overemphasize cash transfers in our system. According to your stat, eh, among social protection supports for those with disabilities, only 4% of expenditure is through in-kind benefits and services compared to 40% in our EU peer group. It's the same proportions when it comes to supports for families and children. And within our meager uh, in-kind benefits um, that we provide, the overwhelming majority of these are means-tested, whereas means-tested plays very little role in so many other EU countries when it comes to in-kind supports. In-kind supports, home helps, transport facilities, caring allowances, occupational training, childcare supports, holiday and leisure centers. These make a significant contribution to living standards and life quality. Now, both insurance and means testing models have struggled with acknowledging, never mind compensating carers for their work. Well, this is, this is a feature of welfare systems historically. Uh, they have taken care for granted, which usually means that they haven't paid for it, but they pocketed the benefits. Uh, NESC has actually done a very good service in the report by detailing many of the ways that caring and the social protection system interface, and so much of it is highly unsatisfactory. Same problem in the interface between social protection and new forms of work, platform work, gig economies, uh, bogus self-employment, which is an abuse of the social insurance system, and many other forms of uh, new forms of employment. Now, some have proposed basic income as a solution to these issues. Uh, now, the problem is when you raise basic income in a room, all, all, all of a sudden, there's a huge argument over it. But let's at least acknowledge that within basic income, there are a wide variety of models that can be examined and tested. And that's simply what the NEST report does. I mean, their, their proposal to trial a participation income scheme, that is a conditional basic, in, that's part of the conditional basic income family. Same thing with, with, with refundable tax credits. So if we are moving towards a social insurance system and solidarity payments with high replacement rates, high income replacement rates. We couple that with long-term social protection payments, which are benchmarked against things like the Vincentians minimum essential standard of living. And then overlaid on that is the solidarity principle of an insurance system. We can begin to create an income floor across society. Just finally, you know, how do we pay for all this? Because it's a, it's a big undertaking. Well, I mean, listen, the program for government has acknowledged it. Business leaders has, have accepted it. Social insurance contributions will increase in the future. And the elephant in the room is employer social insurance. It is half the level that it is uh, 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 throughout the European Union. We would have to double, more than double, employers' social insurance rates to reach the EU average. Let's be clear, it is not a tax on jobs. It is part of employees' compensation and therefore should be integrated into wage, bar wage formation and collective bargaining. Of course, we don't have collective bargaining and it's one more reason to legally mandate it, to coordinate macroeconomic stability and social, and social reform. Let you know, put very simply, if employer social insurance is not substantially increased, then we cannot move to a more EU style insurance model that NESCs envisages. Now this would complement other suggestions that they've put forward, such as taxes on capital, wealth and property, uh, along with capping uh, reg regressive uh, expend tax expenditures to finance both the social and community supports needed to facilitate higher participation and to finance an income, income floor. In conclusion, the NESC report puts forward a number of policy suggestions and areas 
for further research under a range of topics. Let's not get bogged down in reading the document. Let's not get bogged down whether we support this particular suggestion or that. The real strength of the report is to provide a framework within which debate can be grounded and organized so that it can potentially lead us uh, along a long-term roadmap. And we desperately need a long-term vision for the social protection system. So let's start that debate now and let's start it with the NESC report. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Michael, there. Um, and, and thanks again to Helen. And just to say before we begin the questions and answer session that we have, we also have Anne-Marie McGarn here as well. So uh, I'll be directing questions to all three of you. Um, and the first question I have up is from Mary Murphy. Uh, she thanks Helen and then asks, what might the pandemic in income support PUP offer in terms of policy learning or new ideas for reform? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, one of the, th the things was the the uh, the level of the PUP um, that, that was paid out. Um, uh, and, you know, it it it, it came at a level where it uh, it may not have been enough to raise everyone <laughs> out of poverty, but it, because it would have been a substantial drop for some workers. But for a lot of people, it did sustain them over a period of time. Now, you know, they said financially that wasn't sustainable long term and um, it has been uh, graduated uh, since then um, in relation to um, people's uh, earning capacity. But I think one of the learnings is um, to maybe reflect on what uh, Michael has just said and to thank you, uh, Michael, for your response to the report um, is, is a stronger social insurance link um, and a stronger contributory principle link. Um, so in terms of one of the learnings to take from the response, um, I, I certainly think um, that that is, is one of them. Um, I don't know if Anne-Marie wants to, to add anything else. Um, I, I, I think just to add to that, I think uh, uh, Mary Murphy, if you just can recall the question you put to me, was it particularly around the POP or the payments in general? Because no, I think it, 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 it was... The what might the pandemic income support PUP offer in terms of policy learning? It, well, okay, it was the PUP because I, I think there is also learning, as I mentioned in my talk, from the wage subsidy scheme and the link with employers and also the enhanced mm. uh, uh, illness benefit, you know, the importance that people uh, were able to be paid when they weren't at work uh, because they were being tested, etc. And I think that was very important as well. So just to make those two additional points. Anne-Marie, did you want to add anything there? Uh, yes, I think uh, the pub, as Mary uh, would be aware as well, um, is an individualised payment. So it's paid to each worker and it doesn't take into account um, if there is, you know, another partner working in the household. Although I suppose it still doesn't grapple with how you support um, the cost of children in the household. But we do make some other recommendations in the report on that. And the payment also was available to people who actually work to care for their children. So we don't have any statistics on how many people um, were in that position, but it is interesting that it does recognise that um, there are costs in terms of giving employment for caring. So I think there's quite a few interesting things in the pub. Michael, do you want to do you want to add anything no, to I'm, that? I'm, I'm fine. Then um, a question for everyone from an, an anonymous attendee: Has the absence of a proper social insurance system? led to the increase in precarious work in low paid jobs, i.e. does the lack of adequate support force people into low paid work, thereby sapping national productivity? Um, I, I don't think you can just say that. I mean, there may be an element of that, but I, I think that's um, too much of a generalization. And the work that a colleague of ours, Damien Thomas, did particularly um, on, on this area um, was that some of the some of the people who are in these jobs um, are students. For some, they are uh, second jobs for people. Now you could argue why, why are people having to take a second job? Is their, is their first job not, not adequate as well? So I, I think there's a variety. And then obviously there are some people who are dependent on them. So I think there's a variety of people participating in this type of work. Um, I, I think the issue is the exploitation of some of the workers um, in terms of not having 
um, any rights, rights to uh, leave, rights to uh, illness benefits and so on. Um, and I, I think that that does need to be addressed and probably that is where the social insurance element comes in, the collective bargaining comes in, um, the unionization um, of employment uh, comes in to, pro to provide adequate protections for workers. So I, th I think it's quite, quite a complex um, area and quite complex issue and it's uh, not that helpful to generalize too much. Michael, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, 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 I would tend to agree with Helen. I mean, the what has led to the increase in precarious work and low paid jobs is not the lack of a proper social insurance system. It's just capitalism. I mean, I don't want to be flippant here, but that's the dynamics of a market economy where the bargaining power of workers and those social forces most impacted by precariousness and low paid uh, uh, they have very little power, whether it be in the workplace or uh, society. However, I do think that the, the introduction of a proper social insurance system with high replacement ratio can help, uh, can help uh, uh, in terms of uh, promoting productivity, not only through the increase of purchasing power, this is especially uh, as part of a counter cyclical thing, but also because it can help in those situations where people feel they are forced to go into jobs, which, you know, they may, you know, they they, they don't feel really uh, relates to their skills. So uh, you can create a misallocation of uh, uh, skill base uh, skills, uh, which uh, uh, undermines a smooth functioning uh, of, of the economy. But I would just point out that those countries with a proper social insurance system, as Anonymous puts it. Uh, with a very generous insurance system with high replacement ratios. It's interesting to note that on things like the Global Competitiveness Index, those economies outperform Ireland by a significant amount. Uh, so I do think that a poorer, uh, it's not surprising to see a poor social protection system alongside a, 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 a huge segment of the workforce uh, that is low paid and precarious. Anne Marie, do you want to add anything to that? No, thanks. No, there are great responses by Helen and Michael. Thanks. Nothing to add. So Lisa Wilson uh, asks, uh, can Michael, though obviously everyone feel free to, to respond, can, can Michael say a bit more about what he thinks are the relative responsibilities of both employers and the government in ensuring work is decent in terms of earnings or security, and in turn, the relative role of employers and government in ensuring that households have a decent income? Oh, geez. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's, um, that, that's a seminar in and of itself. Um, uh, uh, I, fir I first think that, uh, and I'm sorry to harp on about this, but I do think that if you want to start solving many of the problems in the economy and where the economy interfaces with social protection, you know, the, the productive economy with social protection, you actually start with the producers and you start with people uh, who are actually producing the goods and services. Uh, those are the employees of any firm uh, or enterprise, whether public or private, uh, and uh, you provide them with the rights uh, that allow, you give them the tools to allow them to address their issues, and in so addressing those issues, address the issue of a wider economy. It, you could say it's uh, an Adam Smith view uh, in favor of labor activity rather than capital activity. Uh, so I do think it, the government, it's in, important uh, for the government to, uh, 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 you know, ensure that those rights are embedded in the system. And I do think there's responsibilities for employers as well, because I think that those, those portions, those sections of the employer, employers and the employer class who actually look down the road a bit, should start acknowledging, and many of them have, we've, we've seen IBEX spokesperson talking about stakeholderism. We see that there is kind of a, at even at a, at a, just at a theoretical level of movement uh, towards you know, greater participation and inclusion, uh, whatever that means in practice, we don't know yet. But it's for those employers to kind of lead, not only by example, but lead the debate from their end. So if we had a government that was giving more democratic rights to workers in the workplace, 
and we had a group of kind of progressive employers leading the debate from there. And I think we'll get to a better place. And that's all I can say short of a whole nother seminar on that subject. Helen, Anne-Marie, do you want to tackle that uh, wide question? Yeah, I, I'd like a, a, a contribution to that um, because I think it is it's a whole related um, and important area. And it's something that we're considering as well in relation to good jobs and what are decent, what are good jobs and what is decent work. And <clears throat> there's quite a lot of work going on at this at the moment. And there's some good models uh, available um, from, you know, from the OECD, from, from Scotland and Wales um, have done some interesting work in this area as well. So it's just about defining what a good job is in terms of, you know, of the uh, various types of work, the like terms and conditions of employment, the level of engagement, the um, uh, sense of purpose that people get and reward that people get uh, in, in various levels. So I think there is a whole debate going on on this area, an important debate, and I think that we should engage in that debate <laughs> as a country, as a government, and as employers, and as trade unions, um, and uh, NGOs. Um, and that we should look at and see what others are doing and try and adapt that then to, to our own um, e e economy and employment and social welfare. Anne-Marie, do you want to add to that? No, thanks. No. Okay. Um, so for, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, could an enhanced set of child and family benefits be taxed to ease the transition from welfare to work? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take that. I mean, that is um, quite a, an ongoing debate. Uh, and previously, when I would have worked in the uh, Combat Poverty Agency, we did look at this, uh, particularly, I suppose it's the child benefit one that uh, people look at that is, is paid to everyone. Um, and there are proposals there that if you have a, a, a you know, a high level of child benefit being paid to everyone should do then recoup some of that uh, back through the tax system for for higher payer higher uh, earners, and that would make it um, you know more more targeted in a, in a way, um, but not means tested. Um, but there have been various technical um, and legal uh, uh, issues related to that. That's not to say they couldn't be overcome, but there hasn't been the the will to try and and address that to date. So I suppose that's why um, we've been looking at uh, other mechanisms to try and increase uh, child income support, uh, which is really important, but so are the services area. And uh, Michael, Michael uh, emphasized that a lot in his response. Uh, and because I was talking specifically about the report, I probably didn't dwell on that element as much, but the importance of much better child care supports um, that we do touch on um, and other uh, broader uh, supports for children. Um, in, in, in relation to its kind of education, healthcare, et cetera. So I think that the contribution of that as well as considering taxing uh, child income support uh, would, would be more beneficial. Yeah, in the report, we did look at if you change the taxation of married couples, for example, to focus that taxation relief on uh, families with dependent children, you know, if there was a saving from that, that that could be put into supports for uh, poorer children. But I think it's, um, it's maybe if you look at it, what they sometimes call the envelope of uh, payments for uh, children and families, like why do we spend so much on that cash benefit? You know, mm -hmm. would we be better putting it into the National Child Care Scheme or other things like, you know, mental health for children and adolescents, things that would support people in many different parts of their life. Um, so yeah, it's it's a good question, and I suppose it's a difficult one politically um, to make changes on. Um, and that possibly that's maybe why there hasn't been. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that you could have another seminar on that. <laughs> Absolutely, Michael. Do, uh, have you any have you any views on that? Yeah, I, I think first off, there are there are uh, 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 some uh, family benefits that are taxed: uh, maternity benefit, paternity benefit. I believe. You know the uh, the extent of which there's um, paid leave out, uh, 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 parental leave, and all that. Uh, so, if you expand the social insurance system, uh, uh, well, social insurance benefits are taxed. Uh, the issue here is not the taxation of the benefit, but the the level of benefit. And just to give you a quick example, maternity benefit. In so many other countries, <clears throat> maternity benefit is paid at one hundred percent of the previous pay. That's to ensure that 
uh, a household does not lose any income by having a child. And, you know, and that that's actually probably one of the more expensive periods for a household is bringing a child into the world and all that. Uh, here, of course, we don't have, since we have a weak social insurance system, we have a flat rate payment. So that instead of 100% of the wage, for somebody on the average wage, eh, the, pay, the maternity benefit uh, makes up only about 25%. And even that 25% is taxed. So the principle of taxing uh, uh, family insurance benefits, it's already there. What we need to do is have an enhanced social insurance system so that we can have high uh, uh, income replacement ratios. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, next question is one for all speakers. It's from Lisa Wilson again, um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting one. The Living Wage Technical Group for 2020-2021 cites a gross weekly figure of 480 euro per week to meet a minimum basic standard of living for a single earner, i.e. to avoid poverty. Helen mentioned that the PUP level, the pandemic unemployment payment level, of 350 euro was not sustainable over time because of cost. How do we ensure that the social protection system can ensure adequate standards of living for those, for example, who cannot work or those who lose their job, whilst at the same time ensuring that work pays. So who would like to go first on that one? Okay, since I was a speaker, I, I guess I'd better uh, start this off. Um, yeah, I, I think this comes back to, it, it's more complex than just what's the level of the payment because that's obviously very important, but what does the payment give you access to? And so this is where, is it about increasing the level of the payment um, or is it about providing the subsidiary services or the other services? So when somebody gets a payment, do they have to use that to pay for housing costs? Do they have to use that to pay for childcare? Do they have to use that to pay for medical costs? Or if those costs are already provided through service provision, therefore the level of payment uh, doesn't need to be so high to purchase all of those services. So it is a balance then between what the level of the payment is and what it, 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 it buys to ensure that you're not in poverty. So, I mean, the calculations are from the Vincentians as well as the, the living wage group and so on, um, that these levels should be so high to uh, to make sure we don't have poverty and uh, many of us would would like to see that but in the real world where political decisions are made and finances is available um, that isn't going to happen so we need to look wider than that how, how much can it be increased and what are the other things that make um, that alleviate poverty and make for a good quality of life and attention needs to be given to those as well Michael, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first off, I, I don't think you can compare the uh, living wage uh, and the amount that's necessary, 480 euros per week, uh, to somebody on social protection for two reasons. One, in the calculation of the living wage, uh, it assumes um, uh, private rental accommodation uh, without a HAP payment. Uh, and in Dublin, 50% of the living wage goes on rent. Whereas if you're on social protection, for instance, uh, uh, you will have access to um, uh, the HAP payments and different forms of ha housing supports. And secondly, don't forget uh, the 480 euros per week is a gross wage out of which tax uh, social insurance contributions and other things are paid. So it, 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 isn't, it isn't the same. I think if you look at you look at the if you benchmark the payments today with say the minimum expenditure standard of living by the Vincentians, you'll have a different picture. By the way, in most categories, especially those with, with families with children, they fall well below uh, uh, payments. The payments to the social protection system falls well below uh, uh, that of um, uh, the Vincentians benchmark. And just we have to be we have to be mindful of where the debate will go because I you know remind people who you know can remember the debates, uh, geez, ten years ago or more uh, from the financial crash you had this you had this 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 constant rhetoric that 
oh, uh, social protection payments are too high. People make more money on social protection than they do in a job. Well, finally, I think it was the ECRI that put paid to that nonsensical argument. It wasn't true, except maybe in the most extreme scenarios. But we're also seeing that with PUP, and you've heard employers, well, if PUP continues, we won't be able to, to um, uh, get people to work because they make more, more money on PUP than they do in the workplace. So that means we have to tackle two things at the same time. If you want to raise social protection system so it does hit a benchmark, whether it's Vincenzi and Reset their benchmark, you also have to ensure you raise the, the uh, 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 income floor for those people uh, who are in work. And not only just the hourly wage, but as you rightly point out, Lisa, referring to the per week, it's also about ensuring that people get the hours that they want to work during the week as well. Because there's no sense of being paid, you know, the living wage, but you can only get 25, 30 hours of work uh, uh, a week. You will still be below the weekly living wage. Anne-Marie, do you, did you, do you want to make a contribution there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree totally with what Helen and Michael said. Um, I suppose one other thing to bear in mind is that people don't, you know, they work for a variety of reasons and there, there is quite a lot of people in the workforce who were to argue that there are people who are working who would have more income if they were not working, but they still continue to work. So but that's just another minor point to throw into the into the mix but obviously that doesn't uh, address the issue for people who are not able to work and who are living you know a condition with um, no benefits yeah and um I, i'm struck by um the response in terms of obviously the cost of living and uh, i suppose that brings me to, to kind of my own question about universal basic services uh, and to what extent do you think Helen and indeed Michael and Anne-Marie, that, an that an expansion of universal basic services is part of the solution or not, as, as the case may be. And, and I suppose related to that, what do you think the focus of the Commission uh, on Taxation and Social Welfare should be? What are, the, what are the key reforms that you guys would like to see coming out of that process? Um, yeah, I, I was thinking that I, I just kind of want to return a little bit to the previous question, and um, because okay. I think it's related um, in terms of my answer. I suppose maybe uh, having heard what Michael said as well, it, there there are there are kind of different elements here because there is what is an adequate social welfare payment and for whom, and then there is what's an adequate level of pay um, in relate and. And those things are obviously related, but they're also different because, um, as, as Michael was saying, the living wage or the minimum wage is then taxed and it doesn't take into account family size and things like that. Whereas the, the, the social welfare system can take some of these other things into account. So you're not you're comparing apples and oranges a little bit, even though there, there is a relationship between them. And, the, and they, I suppose I didn't make that distinction when I answered the question. I was more saying income is only part of, of it, is the cost of living and what services are also available. And that's relevant for both people on social welfare and also then for people who are in employment. Uh, um, and I think that's really where the real answer is to this question is about the pro better provision of services um, in our social welfare system. And while we were doing the, the work, it was an ESC report, but we are obviously uh, linking quite a bit with the Department of Social Protection because they kind of initiated an interest in this area. I mean, much of the answers um, in terms of how we get a better system lies outside of their remit uh, in linking with other departments, such as the Department of Health, the Department of Children, the Department um, of uh, Housing. Um, and, and so, you know, that's a more complex relationship, but I think that all needs to work together um, in, in order to provide a better system. I suppose that brings me on then to the question of what uh, should the Commission on Tax and Social Welfare be looking at? And I, I, I suppose I'd give a, a bit of a glib answer there and to say, I suppose it's the issues that we raise in our report, um, because I think a lot of those are relevant uh, to looking how the system uh, moves forward. But uh, certainly engagement in trying to support uh, people not to be on 
only social welfare for long periods of their lives if that is uh, if if other routes or opportunities uh, can be provided for for them and in the past we too often paid people a social welfare payment which wasn't always adequate and there was very little engagement and I, I think it's about engaging and supporting because in, in our experience of talking to people uh, and we did some quite a lot of work with people in jobless households and so on most people are active and engaged but not necessarily always with the system because the system has batted them back so many times because it doesn't they don't fit certain criteria and I understand you have to have criteria to run systems but you know there needs to be some engagement between the two and some flexibility um, around all of that. Michael or Anne-Marie do you want to do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I suppose one of the things, sorry, Michael, um, Go ahead. I would really like to see the, the commission look at the area of tax expenditures because we, you know, there is a lot of work done on them, but we still do have quite a lot. Um, if you think of the pension system, um, there's a lot of tax expenditure there and it mostly benefits um, those on higher incomes while we have low pension coverage um, of those on lower incomes. And I suppose the whole issue of you know, family taxation is an interesting one to look at it as well. Um, so yeah, definitely lots of things for them to look at. Absolutely. Michael? Yeah, um, uh, I have a list of about 50 things I'd like to see, but I'll, win <laughs> I'll winnow it down to three. First off, I think the pandemic has shown that what people really, what people need and really appreciate is security. Um, uh, the state can't do many things, uh, or they can't do everything for us. But what they can do is provide us against provide against contingencies. Uh, we saw that when the state came in very early on, recognized that the illness benefit and the job seekers benefit was uh, uh, not fit for purpose. They substantially increased uh, uh, the payments to give more security, uh, providing free hospitalization for those who, so, who contracted COVID, free hospitalization, free health. So what I'd like to see in the first instance is a strong, the stronger social insurance. And I think you raised it, Tom, universal basic services. Now that means paying for it, higher social insurance contributions, higher taxation, yes. But the fact is that we know that if we hit a contingency, illness, starting a family, old age, uh, uh, temporary unemployment, uh, uh, whatever, it might, whatever it might be, that we have the range of income and services to at least provide security to help us get back on our feet. The second thing is to treat all income uh, equally through a, progressive, uh, through a progressive framework. And that means uh, 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 both capital and labor, income from capital and labor should be treated equally right now uh, we um, uh, we give the benefit to capital income. We discriminate in favor of that. Uh, and thirdly, the taxation system should work and discriminate in favor of the productive economy and disincentivize the financial financialized part of the economy or what would be called the rentier class. We need to build up the productive economy. Uh, uh, we need to drive down rents, we need to drive down uh, prices of assets and the services uh, to those assets in order to let the productive economy uh, to, to liberate, to quite simply liberate it. Lots of following question, follow on questions to all of that from the three of you that I have, but um, I, 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 I'll go with a question from an anonymous attendee next. Uh, does a contributory social insurance system also have the benefit of destigmatizing welfare? And increasing solidarity by broadening entitlement. Is there any evidence to, uh, around that? I, th I think the answer to that is yes. yes. Um, and there, I think there is evidence to that. I, I, there's certainly counter evidence um, that means tested benefits um, are, are quite stigmatizing for people. They're quite complex, they're quite intrusive, uh, that not everybody who's entitled to them takes them up. Um, for a whole range of reasons. Whereas whenever you're contributing to a system um, such as you know, social insurance, and then you require um, a, a, the service or, or the payment from that, um, you know, th that's a benefit back um, and that you're entitled to. So I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> 
no disagreements around the table there, I suspect. Um, just on this issue of um, treating all income equally, uh, I assume you would, or, or perhaps you wouldn't, would you include that as part of that income from social transfers? And in addition, would you treat capital gains as income uh, that, would be, that would fall under income tax, for example? Yeah, we did look a bit at this in the report, for example, the fact that there is, um, you know, a different tax rate for capital gains is 33, 33%, whereas for income tax is 20% and 40%. So there are some arguments, yes, for, for doing that. Um, I suppose that capital gains is another emotive area, but there are very large exemptions uh, for mm -hmm. capital acquisitions. Um, and then there are small exemptions for capital gains every year. Um, maybe that's something the Commission on Tax and Welfare will look up as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we can see in Ireland that there is, you know, increasing wealth inequality, and that is related to capital. We don't really have very good stats on that, but uh, we know that those who inherit the most are, tend to be those from the highest income and wealth quintiles. So there is a growing inequality there, particularly with people being finding it more and more expensive to buy a home. You know, you risk having, you know, assets becoming more and more something that wealthier people have and that less wealthy people just don't have at all. So I think it is an important thing to look at. And it ties back to what Michael was saying about security as well. The whole area of insecurity and housing is something that has a big impact on the welfare system. Um, and, you know, it's a concern of lots of policy areas, but I think it's very relevant to this as well. Yeah, and indeed, of course, capital acquisitions tax is the, the classic unearned income, and, and yet it's treated uh, enormously favorably relative to any other form of income um, that people receive. And of course, the evidence internationally is that well over half of um, wealth is inherited rather than earned, which, which goes against this idea of kind of buccaneering entrepreneurs mm -hmm. generate, generating wealth. Sarah Breeden asks, could an opportunity to decline benefits to which we are entitled be introduced? It could be made available to people who are listed by revenue as being in the higher tax bracket. Civil service can afford the people to deal with the admin of it, according to Sarah, and, and it wouldn't cost much. Anyone have any thoughts? I wonder, can you do that already? Do you not have to apply for things like a contributory widow's pension? Maybe Helen or Michael might know more about this. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think the reference there um, was to higher income earners who may not necessarily need a state pension. I, I don't know if that was the underlying um, element of the question. Um, I, and that is something that we looked at. And again, Anne-Marie might say more on this than me because she, she knows more about it than I do. Um, but I think there are some countries where higher earners... Um, uh, don't get or can refuse. I, I think it's not can't refuse. I think they they uh, don't draw down the state pension to the same uh, in the same way. Um, but I mean, I, there's been some discussion on, on this before. I'm not too up on the literature, but um, I, I know what some people do is that they receive the benefit and then they give it <laughs> um, in, in some other way. But they, then quite often it's philanthropic or charity giving. Um, and then there's a whole debate where people should be provided for things by the state rather than through uh, relying on charity. So you're entering another debate there. But it's a very good question. And I think it's a very it's something that, that we should should think about. But it, it's not the way... I think you would design the system that you would have a benefit that people could refuse. Um, you would want to think about um, should those people be getting the benefit in the first place? And if they shouldn't, then how do you tailor the system uh, to react to that? But it is, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, idea. Sarah specifically mentions child benefits as part of an add-on question. As well. Oh, it's child benefits. Okay, and I kind of answered that question before, I think, about ch ch child benefit. Um, there's a lot of debate about that. Should higher earners not, not necessarily get it? But it's, it's a principle at stake here. I think it's a universal payment for all children. Um, and then how you address that through the tax system or through people not getting it or people handing it back. These things have all been con considered. 
um, but we haven't changed it in that direction yet. And I think the most the more changes are around the means tested element um, and how that can be improved. Michael Anne Marie, do you have any any thoughts on that issue? Uh, I think during the crash there was some uh, public servants who refused pay increases and things. So maybe there is some mechanism to uh, to not receive something that you're being given by the state. But um, yeah, I don't think it comes up very much. <laughs> no, I can't imagine it does. But but there it is all the same. Michael, um, any any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 if I'm getting the question right, is it about kind of declining or is it about, um, you know, withdrawal of benefits the higher up the income tax bracket you go? Uh, it, it, it's whether the individual themselves can actually choose to decline the benefit to which they are entitled. Well, yeah, they just don't apply for it. If, you know, if a high income person becomes unemployed, they don't have to go down to Intrio. They don't have to go down to, you know, the, uh, the Social Protection Office. You don't have to apply for child benefit. You don't have to apply for, I, I don't know what, what, what social protection payments are automatic. Maybe Helen or Anne-Marie might have an idea, but I think you have to, try, rack my head, I think you have to apply for everything. So, you know, it, in that sense, it's, it's, it's um, voluntary, but, you know, with child benefit, you've got like a 98 or 99% take up rate. Uh, and you usually will have a strong take up rate for unemployment benefit and uh, things like that. So I don't think that that issue of declining is a problem. Stephen McNenna asks, would an expanded and improved social insurance system mean a larger gap between social assistance rates and social insurance rates? Yeah, I think this is um, something that has been discussed before. We go right back to 1986, I think, of the Commission on Social Welfare, where um, they, there was a, I think we thought there should be a gap in terms of the rates of the uh, social insurance payments and the social assistance payments. Um, but that has leveled out more or less over time. And if you have the principle, and Michael talked about the various principles of adequacy, um, if that's the, the uh, main determining factor, then it's about the level that lifts people uh, that's adequate, as opposed to whether you've made the contribution or not. Now, you could argue, of course, are the payments adequate? <laughs> um, but I, I suppose the principle then is if you're moving towards a stronger social insurance system, there should be a pay related element to that in relation to your contribution. So by default, that would mean then the social insurance payments could potentially be higher than the social assistance payments. But I think that's a very important debate uh, to have and what the driver of the system is. Um, and I think the, uh, the introduction of the POP payments and the changes that have been made to it reflect some of that. So I think that's definitely one of the issues that the Commission on Tax and Welfare, when it's set up, will need to consider. Anne-Marie? Yeah, I suppose just thinking about, I mean, usually in other countries, you know, social insurance payments are higher than social assistance ones. So that is something that could happen. But I suppose there is an overall question about making sure that the payments are geared towards the needs that people have. So for example, in another study we carried out, we met people who were on means tested social assistance payments who were in a, had a mortgage. So they weren't getting support with their housing costs. Whereas the kind of social assistance was set up, maybe assuming that people lived in social housing, so they paid according to their income or they could get rent supplement or HAP. Um, so there's maybe an issue of, you know, not just looking at a division between different, two different payments, but at the kind of needs that people have in a society that's in a different setup in a different way now. You know, our whole housing system is so different. Potentially in future, we'll need higher pension payments because people are going to have to pay rent from their pensions. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, you could look at that as well. I suppose it brings another dimension to it, but um, could have other things there as well that make the gap between them not so big. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, in nominal terms, yes, social insurance rates would uh, meet a larger gap than currently with social assistance. But uh, proportionately, uh, the system would still remain progressive. Um, for instance, take, 
take unemployment benefit uh, in many EU countries. It's paid at like 70% of the previous earnings. So somebody on 25,000 gets 70% of their previous earnings. Somebody on 45,000 gets 70%. Uh, so in one sense, the social insurance system mirrors the distribution of income, distribution of uh, uh, market income, which again, emphasizes the need to fight market inequality. Uh, but the system is progressive insofar as one, social benefits are taxed. And secondly, in most countries, in fact, almost all countries have a threshold above which, you know, uh, your, your income from previous work is not compensated. So in other words, you can only get a maximum of that. So up to higher income, it becomes less proportionately. But another key reason for this, and this, you know, this, this leads to a very confused debate, but if you provide a high replacement ratio for those on average incomes, they can continue to participate in the consumer economy. That's why it's called an automatic stabilizer. It's intended to, to stabilize uh, the up and down cycles uh, uh, in the economy so that when you're into a down cycle, people are made unemployed, they still have a very high proportion of their income left, they can still participate to some extent in consumer activity, which means that uh, people who are reliant upon the disc discretionary expenditure of those people can still retain their jobs. Whereas if you have a situation like now, it's a, it's a very low rate, it's flat rate for everyone. Well, you will see some very average income households, their income will drastically fall. They have to cut back on so many things. And when they cut back on their spending, especially in discretionary areas, like in retail uh, or, or in hospitality, it's the workers in those sectors that suffer. So that's the principle. The principle of social solidarity is also about the principle of macroeconomic stability. Well, we're getting close to half four now, so I'd like to thank everyone who who uh, put in a question. I, I'd love to thank Helen and Marie and Michael for their excellent contributions. It's been very, very interesting and a learning experience. I, I'd just like to make brief mention of the upcoming NERI webinars. The next one is on the 28th of April, again, Wednesday at three o'clock, and it's four case studies on just transition, lessons for Ireland, uh, with a presentation from Sinead Mercier. Uh, on the 19th of May, uh, it's employment composition in small and large firms in Ireland, skills and quality of employment. Uh, the presenter is Colin McDermott from the Irish Government Economic Evaluation Service and Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. In June, we have low on June 23rd, we have low pay and the living wage investigating the issues. Fran Bennett, uh, honorary researcher at Oxford University, will make the presentation here. And then in July, we have the ninth annual NERI Labour Market Conference, which will be entirely virtual this year again. Uh, a submission deadline for anyone interested is the 14th of May. It goes to paulgk at nerinstitute.net. And the webinar itself will be on the 6th and the 7th of July. So i just finally like to thank Helen, Michael and Anne-Marie again. And we're at half four. So unfortunately, we've got to go. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, bye. Thanks, Anne Marie. Hello. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, Michael. Yes. Yeah.